there's some things you have to unlearn. You know, when you're working with your brother, your instincts can be, you know, to, to use all the shorthand ways of communication that you learned growing up, you know, throwing things at each other and yelling or whatever. Do you want to impact the world and still turn a profit? Then you're in the right place. Welcome to Growth Everywhere. This is the show where you'll find real conversations with real entrepreneurs. They'll share everything from their biggest struggle to the exact strategies they use on a daily basis. So if you're ready for a value-packed interview, listen on. Here's your host, Eric Sue. Before we jump into today's interview, if you guys could leave a review and a rating and also subscribe as well, that would be a huge help to the podcast. So if you actually enjoy the content and you'd like to hear more of it, please support us by leaving us a review and subscribe to the podcast as well. Thanks so much. All right, everybody. Today we have a special guest. His name is Michael Brookim. He is the co-CEO slash co-founder of FabFitFun, which offers an awesome beauty box subscription service. Mike, how's it going? Uh, it's going great, Eric. Nice to be on the show. Yeah, thanks for being here. So why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Absolutely. You know, along with my my co-founders and my co-CEO, Daniel, my brother, and Katie, our editor-in-chief, run FabFitFun. Give you a little bit about the company. We curate a, a box of products every season. It's actually beyond a beauty box. It's a, it's a whole lifestyle experience. So there's products in it in beauty and fashion, fitness, wellness, home, technology, it really can be anything. And we, we sort of use the framing of it's sort of like a happiness membership. If you sort of think of, a di- you know, some of these different memberships might personify a person like let's the beauty boxes might be your makeup artist or your, your beauty shopper. And there's some sort of fashion products, which are sort of your stylist. Uh, we think of ourselves as sort of being your best friend, You're showing you products to make your life better um, and and just brighten up your day and inspire you to, to try new things and stretch a little bit of, uh, or beyond what you're thinking about in that, you know, any given time. We tend to be very busy. And so this is, is, is a real like treat yourself, take care of yourself type of product. And, and that's sort of what we do at FabFitFun. What's like an example? What can I expect to see in like a, like a box from, for this month? Well, I'll talk about our editor's box, which is sort of our greatest hits box um, that's selling right now. It's available today. It has a beautiful sort of blanket scarf from uh, ModCloth, which is another great uh, e-commerce retailer that we've partnered up with. Uh, it has a, a lovely necklace from a company called Juca Nona. It has a uh, different skincare and, and beauty products. So we had an eyeshadow palette by uh, Pure Beauty, a, der- a Dermalogica sort of skin hydrating booster uh, we have a coloring book with colored pencils. We did a partnership with Pencils of Promise in there. And that's sort of like a, almost like if you, if you follow the trend, there's a lot of sort of soothing and, and you know, calming to, to doing coloring. So that's sort of the, the angle there. Um, we also include uh, access to online workouts from our partners at Bar 3. And so it sort of spans the gamut. There's, there's a little bit of everything in there. And, and that's you know, pretty good representation of what we're, what we're doing. Awesome. Great. And how do you guys make money? The old fashioned way. <laughs> we, we, our members pay us. The subscription is $49.99 per quarter or $180 for an annual subscription where you, you prepay. And our members get a tremendous amount of value. Each box has well over $200 in retail value in the products. And then there's a whole sort of slice of content and community features that you get access to as a member we're building on pretty aggressively. So there's a, there's a lot of value for our members and, and that's, you know, that's why they pay us for it. We also have a, a, a little bit of a sort of a heritage as a media business. So um, there's certain brand partners and sponsors that also contribute to, you know, sort of our revenues. Cool. We'll talk about that in a second. And so how did you come up with the idea originally? I think, you know, FabFitFun was in a lot of ways, it's sort of a happy accident and I don't want to take, you know, credit for the idea. I think the idea is, has been sort of a collaboration of um, myself, my, uh, Daniel and Katie, and, and, and frankly, the, the rest of the team, there's been a lot of people sort of around us who, who've helped us, you know, figure out a lot of the nuances. The earliest background uh, in terms of, you know, my, my personal journey that led to, to where we were at, um, I started a digital agency in college doing initially political new media consulting, worked on a presidential campaign, did a bunch of Senate and gubernatorial campaigns, you know, spent a, f- a few years doing that, building websites, doing digital strategy, media buys. At some point, I wanted to be back in Los Angeles when, where I grew up. Um, I was in New York and Boston at the time uh, when I started spending more time in L.A. Someone told me politics is Hollywood for ugly people. You can do this stuff for politicians. You can do this stuff for celebrities and entertainment folks. 
uh, got introduced to our first entertainment client around 2009, which was Rachel Zoe. Um, helped her sort of come up with the concept for and launch the Zoe Report, which is her online media property. And that sort of set things on a totally different direction. We shifted gears fully into sort of lifestyle and entertainment, picked up a ton of clients in that world. And at some point, we just wanted to uh, you know, have our own sort of brand that we were operating. And we'd always done different internal experiments within the agency, um, which was initially called Operative Media. Eventually, we called it Charlie in our, in our Hollywood days. And we launched FabFitFun as an internal experiment. Initially, it was just a media business producing editorial content across all of lifestyle. Uh, and at some point, we said we want to be more than just media. We want to actually have a product. We want to sell something. And we'd seen the trends around different sort of subscription-based e-commerce businesses. We, we, we thought the, you know, sort of the writing was on the wall if you were going to be sort of a niche um, lifestyle content site only. And so uh, what we saw out there in the subscription space, we thought there was just white space and, and no one really taking that sort of positioning of just make your life better, make, make your life happier, brighten it up and, and not care about, you know, is it a beauty sample or is it something else and so we we sort of wanted to create the anything goes in service of making the customer happy model of a, of a membership program launched that in 2013 and sort of the rest is history got it so it sounds like i mean there's a lot of you know agency owners out there that you know eventually want to transition into doing you know kind of launching their own brand right so at what point was it like you know i'm going to go all in you know we're going to go all in on fab fit fun and then kind of do away with you know the agency was it was there ever kind of that transition to be honest, it was gradual uh, because there, there were other experiments. I mean, the, the sort of, you know, the, the trail of dead bodies in terms of things that we had tried is very long. And so when we started Fab to Find, it wasn't, it wasn't, we didn't think this was going to be it. You know, we didn't, we didn't know. We just sort of said, oh, it's interesting. At least it's, it's worth kicking the tires on. And, and initially it, it, it was definitely, you know, strong out the gates. There was a lot of traction just as a media business. Our agency clients helped pay the bills, and we kept that up. Um, and so it overlapped for a couple of years. But you know, I, I think it just you you it becomes obvious when you just sort of you know where there's smoke, there's fire, and 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 you know the thing starts paying for itself. And more than that, um, and we saw that with Rapid Fund, we saw just the the potential was enormous. And so at at some point, we sort of it just naturally just sucked up more and more of our time uh, to the point where there was nothing left. Great. Makes sense. And so in terms of subscribers, revenues, what does those look like? The number that we've shared and, you know, really proud of is we, we did over $40 million in revenue in you know, last year in 2016. And we had in the fall, I believe we, we, we talked about our, our hit crossing the 200,000 subscriber number. We've, you know, we've gone quite a bit past that now, but we're not, we're not sharing those numbers at this point, but we're, we're excited. We're seeing just a tremendous amount of growth that, $40 million number was uh, represented over 3x growth from the year before, which itself was you know, over 3x growth from the year before that. So we're seeing really consistent, um, just a lot of traction and a lot of energy in a very you know, excited, energized community. Our, our members are, are really, really getting, getting something out of, out of their experience. And I think there's just a tremendous amount of sort of word of mouth and excitement around it that's been compelling our growth. You guys seem to be making subscription boxes work and then you see other people in the space struggling. What do you think sets you apart? You know, I, I think the characterization is just, it's interesting. I think, I think subscription is, you know, it's a, it's a sort of form of payment. It's a, it's, a, it's a structure that can work and it cannot work. And what, whatever the underlying product or business is, most products launch, most businesses that launch fail. And I think we just have some sort of high profile flame outs in the subscription space that, that sort of maybe created a little bit of skepticism. I personally think a lot of that is sort of misguided. There's just going to always be business failure, whatever your business model, whatever your payment method is. If you, if you, you know, one of my personal sort of business role models, at least, is, is Jeff Bezos. And, you know, he's, he's sort of done well with a, a subscription by the name of Amazon Prime. Uh, and so I think, I think there's a lot to it. I think there's a lot to the type of relationship you can create and the type of experience you can create with a customer when your relationship isn't purely transactional. Uh, so if, if we were... If every time we wanted to do something for you know our customer, it was sort of just you know a checkout experience. You're just a lot more constrained. Where we just think a lot more holistically about our our customers are our members, and there's an ongoing sort of set of member benefits and perks that we can invest in. We have that sort of relationship of trust where our customer is telling us, "Hey, I'm going to come back quarter after quarter 
and you know with with it, and we have a lot of reliability on it in terms of what that what that looks like and lets us deliver even more value be a lot more efficient create something that we couldn't create otherwise so i i think i wouldn't focus on when you know the if your question is you know what what are we doing right versus what are other people doing wrong i i think there's a lot of people doing a lot right and i'd say the people that are doing something right are creating something really valuable and the and fundamentally it's just a, it's sort of a product question and i think you know we we've created just a, a very valuable product i think and just to clarify on on this part so you know you guys started fabfitfun as as a media property first so is is the kind of steps to success here you know you guys build out a media property uh, it starts to build up a lot of traffic and then you guys layer commerce on top of it is that kind of the model that's how we got there i wouldn't say that that's necessarily like the recipe you know i think there's other subscription services out there i think you know, you can look at Ipsy or Stitch Fix or a number of others that are, are doing exceptionally well and that we look up to. And, and, you know, they didn't have their roots in media. And they, they are actually, you know, if you look at Ipsy, they're doing a ton in, in media and, and, you know, doing really impressive things. And that was just part of the model at, at the outset in terms of sort of this hybrid of, of content and commerce. So we, we, think, we think there is, you know, there's been a lot of sort of promise and peril around how does content and commerce work. But, but we think it's real. We think you know, the, the sort of the Condé Nast magazine, you know, whether it's Vogue or, or any of the other titles or Glamour or Allure reinvented, we think has a commerce engine at the heart of it. And, and I think that's what, that's what we sort of think that's, you know, one of the ways we think about ourselves. Right. And there's many different ways to, to skin a cat, right? I mean, if you look at, you know, you look at Thrillist when they, um, or I guess Jack Thrillist purchasing Jack Threads, I think, and layering it on top. I think that's that's one way to look at about it. And then you talk about Ipsy and the others. So a lot of different ways, right? Oh, hundred percent. There's there's so many. You know, if you just think about retail, I mean, the enormity of the opportunity of these dollars sort of moving online. You know, I think Andreessen Horowitz put out a, a report. Uh, I think Benedict Evans had a nice presentation on this, where uh, he just showed, you know, sort of it's this on this idea of software eating the world. Uh, just industry by industry, how software is sort of reinventing these different industries. Retail is just is an order, you know, not even maybe seven, two orders of magnitude bigger than anything else. You just, you know, if, if if Facebook and Google changed the media landscape, retail is just enormous. You know, all of Facebook and Google's revenues essentially boil down to advertising revenue, right? So they're sort of taking ad revenue and and moving it from all the traditional media outlets into into digital. But what what happens when all the retail dollars? move online or, you know, a bigger portion of them, there's a lot there and there's going to be a lot of winners and there's going to be a lot of different things that work. And I think there's a healthy skepticism about a lot of e-commerce, but I think um, the opportunity is, is so enormous that it's sort of it's, it's worthwhile to, to keep paying attention. You guys, I mean, so, you know, we look at Ipsy, you know, they launched with an influencer. I mean, I, I believe you guys also launched with an influencer too, right? Juliana Rancic? Yeah, that's right. Cool. And how did that work out for you? It worked great. I think, you know, Juliana was a great partner for us. You know, we started the Fab Fun newsletter in a partnership with her. And, it, you know, in a lot of ways, a lot of the sort of brand DNA um, that she sort of imparted into, into FabFitFun helped us find a voice, helped us find an initial audience. That was a really great partnership for us. Great. And do you have any recommendations for people looking to partner up with influencers or pitfalls to avoid? Because everybody's talking more about influencer marketing nowadays. Two different things I'd say. One is, you know, this idea of sort of like partnering with an influencer who's sort of the, you know, the face of the brand. And then there's just influencer marketing, you know, as, as a, as a whole, as a whole, you know, world now is, 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 is a lot more than that. I think what I, what I'd say is with respect to the first category of, you know, partnering with an influencer, maybe having them as a, as a co-founder or initial sort of spokesperson or launch partner or anything like that. I, I think it, it's, it can be very effective. It gets you above the noise. You have to make sure that that's that's not you you know to use a football analogy it'll take you to your you know get sort of you know a few yards after kickoff right you might get ten yards out but it's not that's not the business and I, and I think a lot of people think that you know the right celebrity if we if we only had so and so sort of out there talking about us you know that would be game over and and that's I won't even say rarely the case it's just never the case you you know at the end of the day you have to have a really well run business you have to have amazing products you have to have a great sort of strategy and ideas around marketing and, and a celebrity in themselves isn't going to be the strategy around marketing. And it can be a key piece of the puzzle. And you see something like Honest Company, Jessica Alba sort of is, is the face of the brand in a lot of ways, but she's also, you know, day in and day out there making it happen. Um, really, really 
you know, driving a lot of the creative strategy and, and a lot of other parts of the business. And so that's sort of one aspect of how to work with influencers and sort of the, the caution I'd, I'd put on that. And then more broadly in influencer marketing, I, I think we do, we do quite a bit of influencer marketing today, um, working with different influencers in terms of uh, getting unboxings going and, and things like that. It's been great for us. I think, I think it's, it's whenever you think of media and, and you know, this is a, a growth podcast, so everyone's thinking about how to grow. Uh, a lot of the, you know, some of that's paid, some of it's organic, but, uh, the eyeballs, you know, pe- people, people on, on these social networks, on Instagram, on Snapchat, on Twitter, on Facebook, on, you know, YouTube. And so to the extent that you can get into the stream of where the eyeballs are in an organic and fun way, that's the way you want to think about how to do your marketing or at least a really, really big part of it. Going back to your early days, I mean, how did you go about acquiring, let's just say your first, well, you guys have a lot of customers. Let's just say your first thousand customers. So the first thousand were very lucky. We, you know, we already had built up the media list a little bit. So we actually, you know, had a couple hundred thousand people signing up to be, you know, receiving daily emails from FabFitFun, the newsletter. And when we launched the box to that, to that group, um, and I'll give a lot of credit to to my brother Daniel, who, you know, we we had secured a par- great partnership with Moroccan Hair Oil, um, and we sort of revealed that as a spoiler that everyone was going to get a Moroccan Hair Oil bottle in their first Fab Fun box. So when we when we said that, and the, you know that product itself retails for over forty dollars, and the box was going to be fifty dollars, but ten dollars off your first box. So if, even if you just wanted that product, it sort of made it made it worthwhile. Uh, so we sent that email out and we, we sold out of that box pretty quickly in that, in that first week. Wow. Okay. We'll call it a pre-launch strategy. Is it just a matter of having the landing page up and kind of drumming up interest in it? Yeah. I mean, look, we, that, that list for us was built over the course of years, um, in terms of, you know, the editorial relationship that we had with, with those people. But, but I think, you know, I, I, I think anytime Anytime you want to launch something, you 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 want to have some audience that's you know ready to receive it. So I think I think whatever you can do to build up a list before you launch a product, I think is 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 great. And the other thing I'd say actually on the it's not on sort of a counterpoint, but we've never been sort of a big bang launch company. You know, I've never personally believed that that's the most important thing. I think you you want to do your launches right. You want them to be well executed. You want them to be thoughtful, and you want to get the most out of it you can. Uh, success is is one foot in front of the other, and so you know, get, get the best thing is get something up, get, get something up and running, and you'll iterate on in terms of like how to draw attention to it and how to sort of do your marketing and distribution. It's not it's not a one time shot, and even if it, even if you have a great one shot sort of thing at launch, that's not going to make your business. You got to figure out you know how to rinse and repeat some processes over and over and over again to keep growing. What do you think is the most effective thing that you're doing today in terms of customer acquisition? Not trying to cop out, but so I'm, I'm going to say I think the most effective thing, having a very positive, friendly interaction with our customers. And the reason I'd emphasize that is I think you can either create a vicious cycle or a virtuous cycle in terms of sort of word of mouth. You know, take, I think the, one of the best things is look at, it's always good to study what's the cancel experience um, in any sort of subscription service. Some people make it a real pain to cancel. Right, you have to you have to call in. You might have to be on hold for an hour, and then even then, they're on a script that's trying to convince you, you know, ten different reasons you shouldn't cancel, and then put you on hold, and maybe put you on a supervisor, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What happens is, you know, that might help sort of reduce churn numbers, you know, month over month, or you know, go tell your board that you know, look look at all the people that didn't cancel, you know, for a certain period of time. But long run, what happens is those people have such a sour perspective on your brand and, and your offering. One, they're not coming back. Two, on the way out the door, they're telling other people not to not to sign up. And so you have this sort of like vicious cycle of of negativity that starts to build in the ether. And it's it's hard to really quantify it, but it's just like a negative review here and a you know bad article there that ranks high in Google. And all these things will really crush you long run in your marketing. And you know, I've seen that play out a number of times. Whereas you know, we've we've decided from all of our practices to be extremely customer friendly and just make sure that everyone who interacts with us in any way, whether it's with our customer service or a cancel user experience or anything like that, is doing so so in a in a seamless and positive way. And I think what that's done is create just a lot of positivity, just a lot of you know ambassadorship around the brand. And 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 I think that's you know at the core of what drives our entire customer acquisition engine. 
And, you know, beyond that, we're tactically good across the board. I mean, we, 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 we have best in class people and processes when it comes to paid acquisition, um, whether it's Facebook or Instagram or Pinterest or, uh, you know, or YouTube or the influencer channels we work on. Um, you know, we're, 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 we're doing, we're doing a lot in a lot of places and, and our methodology revolves around just being very sort of data driven and test driven. And, and I think if you, if you do that and you do it, you know, very deliberately and, and have some great creative behind it, you'll get to a great place. What about in terms of struggles? What's one big struggle you face while growing this business? You know, I, I think you're, when you're in the world of, of physical product, there's just, there's just a steep learning curve to, to all of the sort of logistics and operations about moving that product around. You know, I think early on and we, we, we you know, we double shipped a ship, a set of, of boxes. So we, you know, mistakenly, you know, shipped two boxes to about, I don't know, a thousand customers at a time where that was like a monumental mistake for us. I think early on, we also forgot to put one product in a box and that was all due to some, you know, sort of communication issues that, that, um, you know, we, we had an ironed out with a, a, a 3PL vendor at the time. Since then, we've, we've just internalized all of our logistics and operations. We have now our own warehouse, our own fulfillment sort of service and processes. Um, but, but I think, I think really just, you know, so there, there are a couple of those types of disasters that in some ways are unavoidable, but experience really helps you um, iron them out. And I think the best thing there is you know, your mistakes when you're small, you really want to iron out those processes so that you can, you can scale and, and, you know, not make that, those same mistakes that, you know, when you're in hundreds of thousands of units being moved around. Yeah. And this is a quote I, I've repeated on this podcast before, 95% of the time, it's a process problem. Maybe only 5% of the time it's the people problem. Yeah. hundred percent. I, I think, I, I think that's, it's hundred percent true. I think, you know, the, the, the good, great people will also create great processes too. So you want to, you want to, you wanna, you want to figure out, you know, who are those people who are going to develop those processes? I think we're, I'm, I'm totally blessed to have just you know, some incredible people on our team that are, that are really very process oriented and, and, and making sure that we're, we're set, setting ourselves up for sustainable long-term growth. What's one big change you made in the last year that has impacted either you or your business? Hyper, hyper, hyper focused for the first couple of years of launching the box. Uh, I, I, and I don't think it was the wrong decision, but I think in 2016, we just started planting seeds for, you know, five year long sort of oak trees to grow out of. And 2017, we're, we're accelerating on that a little bit. I think focus is the absolute most important thing to achieving success. I think a lot of people probably way, way, way too soon uh, focus on sort of those additional streams and seeds and, and product lines and things like that. But, but, you know, we, we've been incremental and deliberate about it, but, you know, we, we planted a seed in late 2015, beginning of 2016. I'd say that was a big, a big change for us to say, Hey, we're going to create an entirely new sort of revenue stream and opportunity for us. But we launched our, our add on program where people could start adding things to their box. Um, but that we waited a full, you know, two and a half years into, into that, getting that core really ironed out before we did that. But now, you know, a huge portion of, of our growth is, is, is now being driven by this add-ons and it adds an incredible amount of value to the, to the membership. So we're excited about that. And I think, and I think figuring out just how to, you know, I think at, as you scale as a, as a founder and as a CEO, I think you, a lot of your, your decision-making becomes around sort of resource allocation and sort of focus allocation. So I think, I think learning how to do that effectively is probably one of the biggest changes that, you know, where, where I went from really being a practitioner and a doer to, to sort of being deliberate about, you know, thinking through what are the bets we want to make as a company and how do we want to place those bets? Got it. And a side question for you. I mean, your, your, your title is co-CEO, so I'm, I'm sure you might have gotten this question before. So how does that work being a co-CEO? It works great. There's no rule to it. I think in my situation, it's, it's not only co-CEO, it's, it's, it's my brother and we're you know, 13 months apart. We're super close. We grew up together. We sort of have a mind meld type of thing going. So it's, it's even unique, you know, you, you can't really create, recreate that relationship in a lot of other times. So I, I wouldn't, I'd, I'd be, I'd be hesitant to draw too many parallels with even other co-CEO types of relationships, but for us, it's worked phenomenally well. I mean, we've, there's, there's always work to do in any, any relationship, uh, whether it's a co-founder relationship, a, you know, a, a spouse or a girlfriend or, 
um, you know, anything. And, and I think, I think sometimes and I'll speak more towards working with family. I think sometimes when you work with your family, you take for granted the work that you have to do to make that relationship great. I think, you know, Danny and I were so committed to, to making this company successful and to, to building out this sort of vision that we both, we both had for, for what this could be, um, that we, we invested the time to make the relationship work too. There's some things you have to unlearn. You know, when you're working with your brother, your instincts can be, you know, to, to use all the shorthand ways of communication that you learned growing up, you know, throwing things at each other and yelling or whatever. It's possible to unlearn it. I think there's so many advantages we have in terms of, even from a governance standpoint, we have, you know, sort of each other. There's no communication tax, right? We, when, we, when we have something that we want to wrestle with, some idea or some project, there's no... Oh, well, how do I say this or <laughs> anything like that? It, it just sort of like, you know, it's coming from a good place. It's, it's, you know, whatever, whatever the, the feedback or criticism or thoughts are, it's, it's, and it's coming from someone you respect and trust infinitely and has, you know, has a, a purview into the business that's uniquely, you know, like yours. Um, and so the, so the big, I think one of the reasons our decision making has been so good is all the big decisions have been really wrestled with in a good way. And in a way that you can wrestle with it, but still move forward and make a decision, you know, we, we, we're, we're, it doesn't take a lot of, you don't have to set up big, you know, formal sessions and, and write long emails or whatever. We just sort of get to it and, and we can discuss things pretty quickly. So I think it's been really effective. Awesome. Yeah. You know, I, I hear oftentimes, you know, you don't want to work with your friends and sometimes I'm, uh, most of the time I should say, I'm pretty hesitant to, to work with friends, but in, you know, some cases where I work with people, my friends, it's actually been the best relationships because, you know, it's, it's like you mentioned, there's no tax on the, the communication and it, we just move a lot faster that way. So I can appreciate where you're coming from. Final question for you. What is one must read book you recommend to everyone? A must read book. There are several. I'll, I'll say Anti-Fragile by Nassim Taleb. I think that's a great book that sort of informs a lot of how I think about you know, the different types of structures that, that we want to build in our company and, and be, develop a lot of resiliency where you don't, you don't, you don't want this sort of like giant bureaucratic monolithic type of organization. You want something that can, with, that can withstand mistakes, that can withstand, you know, stress. And I think that book is, is, is really insightful in, in terms of its thinking in, in that regard. Great. Well, Mike, this has been awesome. What's the best way for people to find you online? MichaelBrukeem.com is my Tumblr. <laughs> and I, I occasionally post there at Brukeem on Twitter, I'm trying to become a more active Twitter this year or so. Uh, follow me and love to connect with you guys. Awesome. Sounds good. Mike, thanks so much for doing this. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate you having me on the show. Thanks for listening to this episode of Growth Everywhere. If you loved what you heard, be sure to head back to growtheverywhere.com for today's show notes and a ton of additional resources. But before you go, hit the subscribe button to avoid missing out on next week's value-packed interview. Enjoy the rest of your week and remember to take action and continue growing.